It may not surprise you that reflexive, or uncontrollable movements, have been described since the time of Aristotle and Galen. Aristotle in the 3rd century BCE, and Galen about 400 years later. But reflexes wouldn't have been expounded upon until René Descartes made several of his famous observations. It was very Cartesian to imagine that the human body was like a machine, with a bunch of pulleys and levers acting under the control of a kind of soul. Quite right, actually except the soul bit. Descartes thought the soul was in the pineal gland, which is a step up from Aristotle who thought the soul was in the heart, where the blood was the warmest. But Descartes was the first to use the term reflection when describing a person's uncontrolled reaction to a frightening situation, like a foot placed over a flame, followed by the immediate and unconscious withdrawal of it. Several other physiologists deserve mention here. Robert Witt and Marshall Hall for developing the concept of the reflex as we know it today, William Erb of Erb's Point in the Neuromuscular World, and William Gowers from the Gower sign in Muscular Dystrophy Patients, and Joseph Babinski who strived to distinguish organic from hysterical neuromuscular disease. And these guys were practicing medicine in the late 19th century. The neurologic exam as we know it today is only a little over a century old. Maybe that would surprise you. And it was the experience of these great minds and their techniques that blazed the trail for us today. So this week on our show, what we know and what we don't know, and what we can do to know more about the reflexes in our patients. We'll get to that in a minute, so don't go anywhere. This episode was brought to you by Audible, the world's largest selection of high-quality audiobooks. To get your free 30-day trial, sign up on audibletrial.com brainwaves. This week, I recommend Theft by Finding, Diaries, written and narrated by David Sedaris. You can hear this book or 180,000 others at audibletrial.com slash brainwaves. We are also supported by Blue Apron, where you can have farm-fresh meals delivered straight to your door in a weekly refrigerated box, because food is better when you start from scratch. Get $30 off your first delivery by signing up through our blog at brainwaves.me. Welcome back to another week of Brainwaves. I'm Jim Siegler. Every week, another show featuring an important concept in neurology, medicine, or the humanities. This week, we're talking about reflexes. The title of this episode makes it sound kind of dry, but I don't think it's going to be. Because we're not so much going to talk about the biceps reflex being a mostly C5, C6 root mediated arc. You can memorize that on your own time. But what we're going to talk about instead is what is that underlying circuitry when you're testing reflexes? And how do you distinguish normal from abnormal? Joining me in this installment is Eliana Vasquez, a medical student from Texas A&M Health Science Center College of Medicine in Austin. Hello. Thanks so much for coming on to the show. Thank you for having me. All right. Are you ready to tag team this episode? Yes, absolutely. Okay, let's get to it. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. For every stimulus, there should be an appropriate response. A reflex has two components, a neural input triggered by a stimulus and a motor output that addresses the stimulus. The two essential components that create a complete monosynaptic reflex arc are the 1A neuron and the alpha motor neuron. In the case of the classic tendon reflex arc, the afferent limb of the arc innervates the muscle spindle that senses the degree of stretch of the muscle, which is regulated by the cerebral cortex brainstem nuclei and the cerebellum through the gamma motor neuron in the anterior horn of the spinal cord. These muscle spindles register the rapid stretch elicited by a reflex hammer. The afferent limb, a 1A neuron, delivers input through the dorsal root and synapses on multiple neurons that include an alpha motor neuron in the anterior horn, an inhibitory interneuron that inhibits the antagonist muscle, I thought it was kind of elegant the way Eliana opened with Newton's third law of motion here. But basically, that's all the myotatic reflex is. A simple monosynaptic circuit. A highly myelinated, rapidly conducting 1A sensory nerve fiber signaling via the dorsal root ganglion to the alpha motor neuron which innervates that very same muscle and telling it to contract. And also telling the antagonist muscle to relax. And this motor response is proportional to the degree of the sensory stimulus. If you barely tap on someone's knee, for instance, you won't see much of a kick. 
but if you really wail on that tendon, that foot's going to come for you. Reflex evaluation allows for isolated testing of a segment of the spinal cord and its connection to the nervous system as a whole. In general, we grade reflexes from 0 to 4 plus. 0 being no response, 2 plus being normal, and 4 plus when we see a sustained muscle activation during reflex testing, meaning clonus. Besides clonus, other abnormal reflexes can be considered pathologically heightened. The Hoffman sign, which is induced by a flick of the fingertip and results in a contraction of the thumb flexor, is a pathological sign in adults. And everybody knows the Babinski sign, which is one of several dozen different ways of testing the plantar response. A normal response up to about six months of age, the Babinski is elicited by gently stroking the lateral plantar surface of the foot and watching as the toes fan out. But there are also other ways to evaluate for brisk reflexes. Cross responses, as can be seen in thigh adductor testing, also indicates pathological hyperreflexia. Usually these reflex responses indicate spread, which is the term to describe how the efferent limb of the reflex arc involves additional muscle groups. It spreads to those motor units. And identifying spread can be one clue that you have to distinguish pathologic hyperreflexia from normal hyperreflexia because your healthy patient may just have brisk appearing reflexes, and that's okay. Depending on secondary factors such as anxiety and genetic predisposition to excitation, one to three on a grading scale can be considered within normal limits. Age is also critically important here, and you can see a brisk but symmetrical reflexes in younger patients. But after 20 or 30 years of age, these reflexes should normalize. But even more important than necessarily identifying whether reflexes are amplified, I think, is evaluating reflexes in the context of the rest of your exam. Heightened reflexes in the setting of mild muscle weakness should suggest to you that there's a central process, something in the brain or the spine. Because the afferent and the efferent limbs of the reflex circuit are spared, but not enough signal is getting from the brain to the muscle in order to use that muscle. Also, noting any asymmetry is important. Internal consistency that trends over time is important when evaluating reflexes. Asymmetry of the same reflex arc between two sides of the body should be immediately concerning and is often pathologic. One helpful tip is to test the same reflex sequentially. The biceps on the right arm followed by the biceps on the left arm. And the brachioradialis on the right arm followed by the brachioradialis on the left arm, and so on. Doing this gives you something of an internal control during your exam. And when you feel like there's an asymmetry, it's up to you as the clinician to determine which side is the normal side and which side is abnormal. Reflex testing is useful for identifying two findings, depressed reflexes or heightened reflexes. Depressed reflexes or hyporeflexia indicates a component of the monosynaptic reflex arc is impaired. If the hyporeflexia is accompanied by sensory loss in the distribution of the same dermatome, for instance, the anterior aspect of the knee in an L4 dermatome accompanied by a reduction in the patellar reflex, if this same sensory impairment is identified, then the lesion is in the afferent limb of the monosynaptic circuit, meaning either the peripheral sensory nerve or the dorsal root ganglion. And that's the most common reason for reflexes to be depressed, because the sensory nerves are actually affected most commonly in neuropathies but that isn't always the case. If the hyporeflexia were instead accompanied by paralysis, muscle atrophy, and or fasciculations, the lesion involves the efferent limb. And this is much less common than the hyporeflexia caused by a loss of the afferent arm, but can occur acutely in the cases of rapidly progressive motor neuron disease. Typically, we think hyporeflexia is due to motor nerve or muscle disease when there has been significant muscle wasting and atrophy. But clinically, hyporeflexia due to motor neuron disease is difficult to distinguish from hyporeflexia due to a sensory nerve process. This is a key point, and one I can't emphasize enough throughout this episode. Hyporeflexia is most commonly due to a peripheral sensory nerve impairment. But enough about hyporeflexia. Let's move on to what happens when the reflexes are brisk. Hyporeflexia usually indicates an injury in the corticospinal or other descending pathways. Again, pathways that are not essential to a complete muscle spindle reflex arc. The arc is still functional, but is no longer being modulated by the upper motor neurons. Hyperreflexia can be an early sign of corticospinal tract disturbance, 
So the patient can have a lesion anywhere from the lateral corticospinal tract through the medullary pyramid, the pons, and into the primary motor cortex. In adults, sometimes we see patients with diffusely brisk reflexes, and it's hard to know if this is normal for the patient or if it indicates a central nervous system pathology. As patients get older, it's increasingly common to see cervical disc disease cause pathologically brisk reflexes below the cervical cord, so checking for a jaw jerk may be helpful. By tapping the relaxed and open jaw, you can see if it closes rapidly and fully, which will suggest a lesion above the trigeminal nuclear complex or something more systemic. So you might consider imaging the brain in this case, and also ruling out things like anxiety or hyperthyroidism, hyperparathyroidism, or electrolyte disturbances like hypocalcemia or hypomagnesemia when you have a relatively healthy patient. In someone who looks sick, your differential is going to be a lot broader, and it may include things like serotonin syndrome, or posterior reversible encephalopathy, and many other conditions. And again, that's only if you're seeing brisk reflexes everywhere, and they're symmetric. But if the jaw jerk is absent or minimal, but the arm and leg reflexes are heightened, then perhaps the lesion localizes to the cervical cord, either due to degenerative disc disease with chronic herniation, inflammatory cord disease, or something else intrinsic to the spine. Reflexes can be proportionate to intensity. Multiple spinal cord segments can be activated via interneurons extending vertically to propagate an afferent signal. And this is precisely what happens when you see an attending neurologist gently tap on someone's knee, and how different this response is compared to when you see a first-year med student really whack that patellar tendon. A greater sensory signal results in a greater motor output. In the withdrawal reflex, characterized by flexion of the limb from noxious stimuli, the number of muscles involved in flexion is proportionate to the intensity of the stimuli. And it's also what we see in the Cartesian model, where the foot withdraws from the flame. The results can range from flexion of the forearm or withdrawal of the entire upper extremity. Interneurons can also decussate in the spinal column and terminate on the contralateral extensor alpha motor neurons, which produces a mirror image response. If the left leg withdraws, the right leg counterbalances. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So now that we've covered kind of the how of the reflexes, I want to ask you a couple questions, Liana. First of all, sometimes reflexes can be difficult to obtain, as in children or in a patient who's extremely nervous or someone who has difficulty following commands. The first trick that I always learned as a student was to distract the patient. Yes, uh, it's usually really helpful to ask them about something that they enjoy or their preference on something because it usually distracts them from what you're doing because most patients they're are pretty nervous whenever you're doing a neurological exam and something that I, I usually ask patients especially younger ones is what their favorite color is uh, and that usually takes them a few seconds to think about then I, I try to elicit a, a response with a reflex hammer. I totally agree and I think that by doing this you're actually accomplishing two different feats First, it's helping you to develop a rapport with a patient and to earn their trust. And then in the second way, it actually mentally distracts them while you're getting ready to, you know, hit them with a hammer. And as it turns out, this technique has a formal name to it. I didn't know this before preparing the show today, but historians have called it the Jindrasic Maneuver. As it was originally described in the 19th century by the Hungarian physician Jindrasic Erno, the patient would be asked to clench his or her fingers together very tightly into pull. Then the physician would attempt to elicit the reflex. And I'm sure many of you out there have tried it, or something like it, and it actually does work. The elevated tone in the patient would drop, and the myotatic reflex could be primed to respond. But you don't have to have your patient squeeze their fingers together. I've seen neurologists make patients draw their names in the air, count backwards from 100 by 7s in your adult patients, and you can give a patient any task to distract them, because that's all it counts on. Distraction. Eliana, mm -hmm. when you were making notes for today's show, was there something that you came across that you didn't know before? Yes. Apparently, gravity primes extensors. So, like they're, They have heightened reflexes because they're already kind of stretched by gravity, which I thought was kind of interesting. Definitely. And besides the fact that your quadriceps are among the largest muscles in your body, the gravity priming probably contributes to why it's so easy to test for the patella response and why it may be more difficult to test for something like the triceps. Another thing that I found interesting in preparing for this episode had to do with space flight and astronauts. Houston, we have a problem. So, astronauts, it should come as no surprise, 
endure a pretty significant battery of medical testing in order to even qualify for space travel. And even after short trips, a number of adverse effects on their health have been reported. Things like reduced muscle mass and changes in bone density, as you probably heard. And then there's also this condition called space adaptation syndrome, where you have vestibular impairment and nausea. That's kind of cool. It's like one of those um, perpetual motion machines. I know, right? But also, and more pertinent to our discussion, is that astronauts tend to lose their reflexes. That's cool. And this occurs after only five days when you start to see depression of the muscle spindle reflexes. We quantitate this using EMG, and that was how it was kind of first studied. You'd think it was due to deconditioning and muscle loss as you're in a zero-gravity environment. But that would take a long time to recover from, and it turns out that these astronauts actually, within a single day of returning to Earth, much of that diminished reflex arc is restored for them. And by 10 days, it's completely normal. So it's not related to the deconditioning and muscle wasting. Cool. Yeah, very cool. What the scientists who've conducted these experiments have figured out is that it's the microgravity environment that actually reduces the intrinsic excitability of the spinal cord. So those same sensory signals are reaching their respective alpha motor neurons, but the alpha motor neurons now require more of that signal in order to depolarize. That's pretty crazy. Well, I think that covers all the high points that I think we need to make on muscle spindle reflexes today. Thank you so much, Eliana, for joining me in this discussion. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be on Brainwaves. That's it for our show this week. Thanks again to Eliana Vasquez for taking the time to be with us on the show and for preparing the detailed content on reflex circuitry. For more information on what we discussed and some good references, especially all that stuff about astronautics, check out the blog at brainwaves.me. And if you haven't already, please rate Brainwaves on iTunes or wherever else you get your podcasts. But only do this if you like it. Brainwaves is produced by Erica Mejia and myself. Music was courtesy of Comicu. Shazar and Jason Shaw. Don't forget, you can still get a free 30-day trial of Audible and an audiobook of your choice if you go to audibletrial.com slash brainwaves. Anytime you sign up, it supports our show. And if you don't like it, because you're just not into books, then you can cancel it without being charged. I'm Jim Siegler for Brainwaves. Talk to you next week.